Thank you, Adam. A lot of food for thought there with a systems thinking approach to impact investing. And uh, with that, just touching upon a topic which a lot of the earlier speakers have spoken about, the role of technology in being a catalyst for growth for impact. As we at IIC have been looking at the research numbers and the trends that are coming out, a lot of technological innovations have come up in the last decade in India across sectors. Right from fintech to deep tech, there is a lot happening out there. However, what could be the pathway to balancing this technological growth with actual inclusive impact on ground is what we hope to understand through our next session. The understanding the catalyzing role of technology in the India impact story is what our speakers are going to be talking about. And with that, I'd like to invite our next panel on stage. Jinesh Shah, co-founder and managing partner Omnivore. Shashwat Rai, partner at Avishkar Capital. Swapna Gupta, partner at Avana Capital. Unfortunately, Mayur's had a delayed flight. However, we do have Vaibhav Doshi joining us. He's executive director with Somerset Indus Capital Partners. And moderating this stellar lineup is Richa Natarajan, partner UC Empower. Over to you, Richa. I think the crowd has thinned out already and everyone's really hungry. So we gotta make this interesting. And, and we'll try to do our best. Um, I, I have four, what I would say, complete pioneers in the impact space broadly, but using technology very differently. You know, Vebhav coming from the health tech side, Swapna on the climate, Shashwat with financial inclusion and then include, you know, going broadly into uh, impact, and obviously Janesh on the IT side. They've all done the hard work, is what I'll say. Extremely hard work, big sectors which you know, didn't exist when you guys started and really built a space for it. So maybe with that, I'll just, you know, first start with Swapna. Why climate? It is hard, it is difficult, and it's not an easy place to be. Uh, long gestation periods, returns haven't been proven. You were doing something, you know, really nice at Qualcomm on the tech side. Why jump into this now? You know, this seems like an LP conversation, why climate? <laughs> but honestly, I think, uh, as I think about India, how it has transformed, right? All of us come from a place of, of course, we are ca all capitalists by the name of our names, but uh, come from a place of purpose and passion of what is the next big thing which can be built in India. And I think last 10 years, India really has evolved, uh, where digital really built the rails to the economy today we are, right? At Qualcomm, the idea was to invest in deep tech, digital technologies, which could build the India for today. But I think India for today is also vulnerable. Uh, that is the place where it came that, look, technology is transformative. It can create large, big scale impact. Uh, but someone needs to do it full time, focused on a sector by sector, which are impacting climate. So then we took this sort of approach, climate is hard, people don't understand climate. When you tell them agriculture is climate generation, I'm laughing, people will say, how is agriculture climate? Then you have to give them half an hour note on why agriculture is important to climate, right? So I think for us, we said there are three key sectors in the country which folks are focusing on, but nobody's really putting the climate lens to it, which is supply chain, mobility, energy, food consumption, sustainable agriculture. And given we understand technology, we have spent most of our careers doing this, let's start on this journey. And again, I think Richard, to your point, uh, it was why climate. <laughs> Will India see large companies come out of climate? But as I think about globally also, and we are part of a lot of global networks, and we've seen how US and Europe really have transformed. India needed its breakthrough energy, so to say, right? And India, there was no one saying technologies of today will change tomorrow. And honestly, technologies of the past are not sustainable. What was a great technology in the past is becoming bane in some sense in most sectors. So how do we transform these sectors? So yeah, the hard part of helping people understand that now is the time, now is the tipping time point, was hard, but I think now we are at a place two and a half years later that we have raised a fund, uh, we have established that if you have to solve for climate holistically in India, Global South and rest of the world, at least 200 large companies should appear from India in the next 10, 20 years. So let's go long on India. So maybe give us one or two examples. I mean, I have to add one thing. She is trying to create, she is focusing on the world's biggest problem, hopefully to create world's biggest exits for her again. That's true. 
Um, so, you know, just given what you said, building in India for the world is not easy. It's, it's been hard and has been very, very difficult and has not really proven out in the way one would like it. You're very bullish on it, obviously. But maybe give us those one or two examples of either companies or spaces you're really excited about. Absolutely. I think uh, real examples make people also believe that the power of the country. I think usually I start by saying that we are the country which put lunar launcher on the dark side of moon at half the cost of movie interstellar, right? So we have the technologies, we have the capacity, we have the intent. And if I think about India's last 10, 12 years journey at Qualcomm, we did invest in companies like Tonbo, which was making infrared cameras, Idea Forge, which was making drones. And 10, 12 years back when we invested, people said, are you crazy? Why would you even invest in this companies? Nobody would buy deep tech built in India for the world. And those companies became real uh, over time. I think in climate, we are at a similar space. I think we're starting to see some reverberations happen in the form of sectors like EV, solar, where last 10, 12 years, really, the ecosystem was built. And now we are seeing great and good companies come out. And most public investors have also participated in some of them. But I think as you think about next 10, 12 years, we will see companies which are building for sustainable agriculture. So for example, we have a company called Iki. It is, if you go to Iki farms in Kota, you will be surprised by the kind of potential of technology. They have built this polymer chamber in which it's soilless, 80% less water. They are producing tomatoes at eight rupees a kilo, which is what the common man wants. And despite floods, drought happening anywhere, it's in deserts of Rajasthan, plus 40, minus 8, very little water, and they're producing everyday Bharat ki sabzi at everyday prices. So that's the potential of technology, and that's our adaptation story also, right? The climate will change, we still need food on our table. Now that's fantastic. And Janesh, you've, you've been doing this for, I don't know, 15 years or so now. I remember the first time we met when nobody wanted to look at agri. Everyone said it's not a sector that's investable. You've proven everyone wrong, right? And, and turned this around. Just maybe talk to us about the journey that you've seen. But let's make it real. Like, what's been so difficult in agri-tech? And what continues to be difficult? And what went wrong? Look, I think agriculture, the biggest challenge is it's a time. Uh, because unlike any other sector, let's do financial inclusions or you take technology, where an entrepreneur can do multiple transactions in a day, Right? In agriculture, if I miss one crop season, I lost my six months. It's a sector where there's no glamour. It's a very dirty sector, right? In terms physically dirty. You have to go in the mud to ensure something does well, right? That's a sector to bring <coughs> investors to understand that story in the first few years was a challenge. Uh, I mean, when we were raising the funds for the first time, VC was like a, a bane. No one wanted to talk of VC as an industry and doing agri-tech. It was like a big disaster, right? So, I mean, just took too much of effort to do that. But look, now over the period of time, we've been able to see companies scaling up. Now, companies have reached a few hundred million dollars of business, running profitably. Hopefully, next few years, we'll show some decent unicorn exits as well on the IPO markets, right? But you are starting to see strategic exits happening on a regular basis, right? So, that's something which has worked out. And what's not really worked out that I mean, the perception still is difficult, right? Everyone thinks that you can do a big SaaS company faster and make more money. I mean, in agriculture, that's not easy. But the uh, good thing in agriculture is that companies don't burn out also fast, right? I mean, you continue to do for a long time. So if you're able to get a patient capital and have a decent entrepreneur, you are in a position to create profitable exits, right? Uh, fortunately, in the last few years, the SME IPO exit is also a decent option. So if someone is not looking to get a unicorn exit, but okay to get $200 million exit, I mean, this is for real, right? So things are looking that way. Uh, but yeah, still convincing people, the entrepreneurs, everyone about getting in the agri sector uh, is tough. Fortunately, in the last two, three years, when the climate has become at the forefront, that has helped our sector because for us, agriculture and climate are really joined, at least in the, in the few of the areas, right? And that, that helps you to get more and more capital. Uh, so it helps us to get a better narrative and get better things. Uh, but yeah, getting investors to understand agri is sometimes saying, it's still a tough one, yeah, I, mean, I still can do the same challenge. Yeah, I, I totally hear you on that. 
<clears throat> let me push you a little bit more. Tech and farmers can be at you know, sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. As soon as you think about tech in a business which just requires so much manual labor and has, and so when you're being so disruptive, possibly resulting in job losses, you need people to upskill, etc. How have you looked at that counterbalance? So is, is agri-tech really impactful, or is it detracting from it? Look, I mean, farmers are tech savvy in their own ways, right? I mean, if you take a look, Indian farmers, uh, if you look at a BT cotton, US took nearly three decades to get the entire country to have BT cotton. I mean, Europe took like, I mean, countries like China and others took like one and a half decade. Indian farmers moved from zero to 98 in seven years, right? Our farmers, they are not tech savvy in the way we think is, but they can talk WhatsApp, they can play entertainment, and they also realize if there is a money to be made, they can do it, right? That was shown in the COVID times where they could reach out to consumers directly via social media. Now we have few farmers coming with their own YouTube channels with a few million uh, uh, followers in them. So that is there, right? But if you tell farmer to use the technology for sake of technology, outside of his entertainment zone, he will not use that. Uh, the money to be made, he needs information. He wants to hire a machine for his business of farming. He will use technology. Sometimes it's it's very high end technology like apps and everything. Sometimes it's just an IVR phone call and say, "Can I call you and get it done?" So it is relative. Uh, but Indian farmers use technology, and I think globally all farmers use technology. We've been using new seeds, new varietals, new bio inputs. I mean that's technology, right? I mean might not be, but now at least we are flying more drones. Than, than a lot of other sectors, right? In the next five, 10 years, we'll have more IoT devices in the agri sector than any other sector would have it. So I think it's changing, I mean, uh, but it's going to be looking different than what we generally feel like is about. Just moving to Shashwat, you know, uh, you've looked at the evolution of impact from an accessibility, affordability, inclusivity, all of that lens, right? And you've seen the journey through through the years, through the last, you know, sort of two decades. In financial inclusion, we're beginning to see a lot more tech come in, you know, just like Agri, and, and there's an intersection amongst all of these sectors. When RPI comes out with new things like the universal lending interface, how does that impact how you think about tech, and how do the founders in the room, how should they be thinking about it? Do you think it's disruptive to these businesses? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Richard. So we've been uh, operating in financial inclusion space for the last uh, 17, 18 years, uh, where we wanted to first reach out to underserved uh, rural communities and uh, solve for the access to credit problem. And microfinance was one of the vantage sectors for us where we did a significant amount of work between 2005 and 2010. Um, what we have seen over a period of time is that you know, the accessibility is getting better, but the pace is not what we desire it to be. Um, and that's where, you know, unfortunately, RBI's bent is very clear that uh, how do you design a digital public infrastructure? Who is it really meant for? Whose problem are we solving? Fortunately, RBI's bent is very clear that it is directed towards people who don't have the uh, access to financial products and services today. And hence, the directionality of all the reforms which are coming up, uh, be it uh, UPI or OKIN or ONDC uh, or, uh, or ULI, everything is directed towards the underserved segment of the society which is of interest to people in, the, in this room. Now uh, in this what tends to, what tends to happen uh, is that you know typically uh, there are parallels drawn that there was a certain journey that UPI had between 2016 and 2024. Uh, will we be able to replicate the same journey in some of these new platforms which are coming up? Uh, I think my personal view is that uh, these are you know, very different problems that are getting solved. So payments, for example, today UPI has come to a scale of close to 46 crore transactions on a daily basis. India disburses about 10 crore loans on an annual basis. So, Disbursing loan versus doing a remittance is a very different kind of a ball game, and you require, you know, a very close-knit 
kind of group uh, the sounding board has to be has to be someone who thinks about all the stakeholders what i mean by that is if there are entrepreneurs solving uh, for one element of let's say a uli uh, you know infrastructure uh, will they be able to have sufficient revenue pockets while they can get access to volumes will they have sufficient revenue pockets or not is something that needs to be also thought about and iteratively solved for uh, it should not happen none of these infrastructures should lead to a situation where consumers have disproportionate benefit but the people who are solving for it may not have disproportionate uh, sort of benefit in participating and solving for it so i think those uh, those kind of thought processes will evolve as the launches start happening as things start coming together but prima facie having a digital infrastructure is extremely helpful uh, the, there is a very clear demonstration in terms of kyc being a, a, a very difficult problem to solve now kyc is largely a digital kyc uh, led process even some of these grassroots institutions like microfinance companies have largely become digital collection agencies hardly anyone is dealing with cash these days so some of these big picture hygiene factors are already behind us and whatever is coming next is solving for the next leg of problems that how do you solve for these offline processes which are very time and cost intensive and roll it up into a platform play where every specialist is contributing and is able to benefit a wider community one of the biggest problems that startups always faced was that if you are a fintech solving for a particular problem you have to convince a bank one by one and try to do that linear journey now with these platforms you can have a, a definitive non linear journey in participating as the platform grows your you know your participation and contribution to the growth of that platform can grow in a very non linear fashion so those are opportunities which are emerging uh, but having said that there has to be a very careful balancing which needs to happen which makes sure that every participant has a reasonable amount of benefit the all the big picture concerns if, if banks are concerned about their customers getting poached by someone else how do you solve for that right so those are some of the big picture concerns that have to be very carefully addressed if they are done then in an iterative fashion we are definitely going to look at a much much more efficient future as far as financial inclusion is concerned you touched on some really interesting points and you know at the intersection of agri finance climate finance health finance there've been a number of players that have come up and that have tried to solve for those problems often times you know push back from investors like us as the market's not is too small you're not ready can you really make this large enough will i get the kind of exit i will do you feel bullish that there are opportunities in the sector specific financial inclusion players and and i'll ask all of you to sort of answer that in your specific context yeah i think specialization in finance is something which is not new so for example if you were to solve for housing housing finance then you need to be a specialist in sops of housing finance similarly you know in agri there are so many nuances to agri financing if you want to give unsecured loan to a farmer and create a very robust collection engine around it and a robust underwriting engine around it it is a it is a process so i think finance is a very specialized subject it requires specific level of knowledge and understanding to develop and hence vertical finance players typically have a you know a, a good chance of scaling up and 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 uh, creating creating value for themselves and their stakeholders uh, with these digital infrastructures coming up some of these elements will become more seamless for a new startup who's coming in uh, so the zero to one journey can be relatively less friction compared to what it used to be 10 15 years back but for sure these are pockets where there is definitely a need for very verticalized specialized players who are solving for it so what now do you agree you think there is in the climate space so for example if i look at our own portfolio right we have two companies which are doing financing plays one is a company called eram which does solar rooftop financing again coming from the fact that enterprise solar is largely solved for has been done but rooftop is a large space which needs solving white space so can we build a financing 
large full stack platform there. So we invested in Aram. The second play we have done is called Turno, which is an EV financing play. Again, came from a place that EV adoption needs to be faster than it is today. But one of the biggest bottleneck from the technology point is nobody knows how to underwrite the battery. We all know how to underwrite IC engines. That's how traditional financing models have worked. So how do you change the model to accommodate the new EV plays and let's understand battery better. So of course finance can come from Avishkar, can come from us. We come from a very climate point of view that we can help technology underwrite batteries better. They can come from the place that we can help underwrite the books better, right? So I think everyone converges to your point at some place and climate is sector agnostic, so is finance. Super. So Weber, on the tech side, right? Um, healthcare today, especially on the health tech side, has been very difficult for investors to underwrite. You need a very deep level of specialization, you know, whether it's devices or otherwise. You've been in the space for a long time now. Just talk us through your journey a little bit. You know, what's what's it been like investing in health tech in India, and where are you seeing the next wave of innovation coming in? Thanks, thanks. So I think, you know, there are multiple parts of the tech and how it kind of dives deep into healthcare or health tech. If you look at, so there are largely product and services side, and there is a way to approaching the problem which may involve the tech. We, in people think of it as it has to lead to a better clinical outcome. That is the tech. Now, tech is actually much, much beyond that. So I'll give you an example. We have a couple of portfolio companies, which, uh, you know, they were the first ones to do tele-radiology. 30% of volumes came through that. Now, that allows you to go into a completely different type of market, deliver it at a, you know, much better cost. And also allows, once we create that market, it is a market which is only going to grow from here as people kind of get comfortable. If you look at, you know, some of the other developed worlds, now people are open to doctors sitting 5,000 kilometers away and doing a robot surgery from 5,000 kilometers. These are fairly complicated surgeries. So, I mean, we, we have a couple of companies which are kind of adapting to this. So, it's also there in the delivery. It's, in that sense, it's also there in a lot of small little things that a hospital needs to do. So I think it's getting adopted reasonably well on the service side. On the product side, I think the world historically has focused more on clinical outcomes as the as the tech. But I think it, it goes much beyond. It, it goes much beyond in terms of, uh, you know, how you are delivering that product. Uh, so the drug delivery forms are, are, are one part of it. The clinical side is the second part of it, I would say. And the third part, which is, you know, is more around, I would say, how how it is kind of uh, uh, you know thought about from a customer standpoint and what i what i mean by this is that uh, does that process or experience make it very seamless to him it doesn't have to be a fancy stuff and that's what people kind of forget uh, you know that uh, if you kind of just make the whole process simpler uh, you know nobody likes to go through uh, you know i would say uh, five level of uh, uh, you know processes and they will give you an example uh, in radiology, this is already happening, right, with the image tech, etc. Right, so they're giving you a three-level uh, refined output uh, through an AI be before kind of you taking opinion from three other people, right? So it may look like you've reached a stage much before. Uh, so my view is that this is going to continue to happen. The product side of India, I think, is, is still, you know, kind of coming along because most of the innovation, yes, continues to be backed by insurance in some form, continues to be backed by US. But I think the time has come largely because India is a very large market. And any any kind of step that you take to solve it in an affordable way, uh, I think people want to come to India for the distribution pipe and the, for, for the market. So the innovation has to come. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. So India is the largest sandbox, right, for all of these sectors that we're talking about. And we've played that role in helping accelerate, and especially on the financial inclusion side, very clear, you know, the kind of work that has been done. Give me one or two examples on the health tech side, where you're either seeing that happen or it has happened already. So how do we inspire the audience to get into health tech? So I think tele-radiology is, is a clear example where uh, we are seeing more and more people adopt, uh, right? So that's a, that's a clear example. I think uh, on... Uh, you know, some of the manufacturing bit, there are companies in India which are manufacturing at, I would say, um, on the 
uh, on the insulin side, some of the APIs, there are companies which are manufacturing at probably 20% below the world's largest players. So, I think it's a question of what works for India, I'll tell you, and then we can kind of go around to see what can eventually look like an operational factor. We have the largest base of chemists. We are very, very good at engineering. We are very good at manufacturing in general. Uh, we understand regulation and compliance is reasonably well. We have the large domestic market to kind of bring something to India and test it out. You know, even if you get one state, that's big enough. So anything that kind of combines all this should work well. And you need to have an element of affordability into this because the first market you are likely to test will be India. And the other markets may be large, but nobody else has the incidence rates that we will have. Nobody else, just sheer population. So yes, we don't have insurance, but we have the incidence rate, and that's that's very very large. Super. I think the audience is falling asleep. So so Ranjana and folks, if you guys don't mind, we'll just open it up to questions. I want to make these guys a little uncomfortable, and hopefully some tough questions will come up from there. I think everyone's ready for lunch. I think we have someone back there. Um, can you hear me? Is this better? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, my name is Supriya Sharma. I'm from IMA Ventures. And thank you for asking uh, the promising questions to the panel. I want to maybe ask a slightly harder question. Um, what technologies, what products are you not bullish about? What would you not want to invest in uh, for each of your uh, sectors? Yeah, so I think two, three pointers, right? I think any technology has to lead to productivity gains in, in some form or the other, right? Either it saves time or, you know, it leads to better outcome. Uh, so anything that doesn't do that and is just pure convenience, I think will not have the same type of momentum that, uh, you know, something that leads to uh, productivity. And I, I'll give you a, another example. If you look at world over 40, 50 years and look at big indexes, uh, whether it, they are NI, NYSE or uh, other things, you look at stuff that improves productivity in that list of companies, uh, right? You will see IT right there, right? Because it's doing the same thing in a much shorter time. And this trend is an extremely strong trend. And you, you will, I think it's at the core of almost every business that kind of exists. The question is what, what delta you're creating in that and what you're making redundant. If you're, in every technology, something has to become redundant. Right, so if you're not seeing that and it's a, just another player in the market, addressing a different need, then it's not really in that sense a technology bet. It's a, it's a market bet, which is a different bet. I think it's a very good question and I will answer this in a slightly longer way is I think we all are VCs uh, which means we all are responsible to return the money that we raise from certain stakeholders which means for us it's important to see the technology that we invest in has a product market fit, has a scalability question, has a return quotient to it, right? So typically if I think about climate tech, let's, because that's a sector we invest in, Today, climate tech is very, very early in terms of maturity of technology curves because honestly, I would say 80% of the technologies which will solve for climate don't even exist today, right? So if you ask me to invest in something which will get adopted 10 years later, I probably will shy away today, maybe not in three years, maybe not in five years, right? So it depends on the timing of the adoption of those technology curves. And we usually look at it in a matrix format, which is... Uh, is the technology ready, mature, TRL levels? Is the corporate ready to sandbox? So for example, I might have the best packaging material which can reduce the carbon emissions to the best extent, but HUL, ITC, Nestle says no, we are not ready, our customer is not ready, who will absorb the cost? Probably come to us three years later. That is when we will think about whether it's ready for adoption. The third way we look at it is, is the regulatory ready? to move in directionally that way. I think while we all embrace the fact that India today has a lot of solar, a lot of EVs, 
honestly, a lot of it has been pushed from the top, right? We had the first solar policy, we had the first EV policy, now we have pushed towards EPR, BRSR guidelines, CBAM coming its way, right? So a lot of this will push the industry in that way. So I can say I'm a great VC, I understand technology, I have read everything possible, that doesn't make me a great VC at all. What makes me a great VC is timing the market, right? So very pertinent question. Some technologies may not may be very good, but may not be relevant from product market fit or TRL level, so we will avoid those. Yeah, in the same breath, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the critical factor of evaluation is always the delta created by that technology and the timing in the market as, as uh, was rightly pointing, pointed out. Because what tends to happen if you, for example, if you went to Global Fintech Fest, you will see that still a lot of people are, you know, solving for, say, digital KYC, right? Uh, there will be 500th player or 600th player solving for digital KYC. It's something that VCs will typically not get excited about. While they may create a business of certain size, and but the novelty and the real burning need in the ecosystem has to be appealing enough. I think that's one of the fundamental things that if today the digital infrastructure is moving in a certain direction and there are spaces which are extremely you know, vacant, uh, can you take that tall order problem and go after that? And that will be more exciting for a VC like us, rather than trying to optimize that somebody is able to efficiency and you are able to offer 15% efficiency and with that pitch you are going and making a name for yourself in the market. Probably VC may not invest, uh, some permanent capital structures might be okay for that, uh, but that factor of timing, the burning need, uh, the novelty, undiscovered market, very few incumbents who have reached a certain place, that has to, I think, uh, in my view, be there for that to be attractive. Now, look, I have a very different take, right? I mean, look, I would invest in any technology, provided the entrepreneur knows his, his or her end game. Whatever technology he or she can create and make three, four hundred, five hundred million dollars of business, get me a logical exit, I will invest, right? I have a limited, finite time frame to invest and to get out. So, if someone is coming with technology which can get me an exit in five years, I will play. I mean, if it's a minor improvement, I will still take it. If it's a major, I will do it, right? But I will not wait for someone to do something in infinite time period. Uh, so, that's how I will do it. So I would not get into what not I. I can invest in anything. And we make a lot of mistakes. So, happy to make those mistakes again. So, for example, if you want if you want real examples, I don't think any of us will invest in nuclear today, right? Well, it's happening in Europe and US as to solve for climate. I think India, we don't even know the policies around it right now. I'll, I'll just ask a follow-up question, Janesh, since you said we're not perfect. We certainly aren't as VCs and, and we make mistakes. Um, and maybe for all of you, one company you wish you had invested in but you passed on. Look, I don't think I regret anything. I mean, I just missed out, I missed out. I don't even remember what I missed out uh, and I let it be because, look, there are so many opportunities which keep coming in and if I start even thinking what I've missed out and keep pondering, I will, I will I'll go crazy, right? I have missed out many things, yeah. but so I don't want to comment anything on a basis. I, I, can, I missed quite a few, so <laughs> I have a huge list of anti-portfolio because I think in our jobs, uh, I feel all of us typically see 800 to 1000 interesting startups a year, we probably end up investing 4 to 5. Some are misses, some are hits and some are misses being in portfolio, some are misses because we didn't invest in them. I think for me, I have a story from 2014, Aether came to us when I was at Qualcomm, they said we want to work with you on the latest infotainment devices etc, build the best bike and we said, are you kidding India electric vehicles? Nobody is going to adopt it, right? Aether is still out there. We don't know whether it's a success story or not. But I think as we see, sometimes we also have our own lenses closed to figure out what is really coming our way and then we are struck from somewhere where it really takes off in the market, right? So again, my learning is learn the market, keep learning the market, don't have your eyes closed to new opportunities coming your way. Yeah, I think uh, uh, same boat as everyone else here, lots of inbound proposals. So obviously we also tend to do four, five, six deals a year. So 
there will always be a lot of winners uh, who will get missed. A couple, uh, for me, instant, uh, incidentally happened in Indonesia when I was investing in Indonesia. There were a couple of fintech companies which I think I rejected because of my preconceived notions that these are solved problems in India. And they came to us at seed stage. Uh, they generated, uh, I mean, the person who came in, they made about uh, 50x in two years or something like that. So it was a crazy exit. Um, very good entrepreneurs, as Janesh was saying, that people who really knew the market in and out. And uh, it was actually in a you know digital post kind of a space, uh, which if you hear in India, you don't feel so kicked about it. But Indonesia was a different market. Uh, POS, the, the kind of experience differential which they created along with the ledger functionalities, etc., was very different. Uh, and uh, our local investor ended up investing. But these, these stories will keep happening. You just have to uh, get on with it. We've seen, uh, I mean, my consistent mistake, I would say, which I've seen a number of times is some of the products kind of give, get far better market than what we anticipate. Uh, especially like the, I would say, nutraceutical wave oil happened globally. In India, you know, you'll you be amazed. There are companies selling one single product getting to 400 and 500 crores. There's a company which sells Ashwagandha. 400 crores, single product, single brand. Uh, there are nutraceutical companies like that. So I think I have, I don't know, for some reason I seem to have made that mistakes again and again. Just shows we're all human. But one of the things, you know, we were discussing about in the panel a little bit earlier is a no is not all, not a no forever. But, you know, Janesh was talking about that. And I'll leave this with for all of the audience. If any of us have said no to you, it doesn't mean a forever no. They're going to kill me for saying that, but, but I think it's our time. So thank you all for this. Thank you.